In this video, let's take a very introductory look at this concept of XVA. So what is XVA? Think of XVA to be a series of, or let's say a family of valuation adjustments, which are all linked to, or let's say focused on this very important risk called counterparty credit risk. To understand XVA, let's first try and understand a few costs, in some cases, there will be benefits as well, which are associated with holding a portfolio of derivatives right from inception all the way till final settlement. Let me assume that I have done a portfolio of trades with a single chosen counterparty. They were all done at this point in time. So this is my initiation date. As of this date, each and every trade in this portfolio was valued at zero. So the aggregate value of the portfolio was also zero. Okay. Now, what we've plotted here is the evolution of the aggregate value of this portfolio as I move from inception, the initiation date, to the final settlement. So this evolution that we've drawn is a very stylized evolution, just to illustrate the concepts involved. Okay. Now, Please note that the aggregate value that we are focusing on here is the value from my perspective. It's the value which my risk systems show at any given point in time. Okay. Now, let's say from a counterparty risk perspective, in order to mitigate this counterparty risk that I have from this derivatives portfolio, Let's say I have also done a collateral arrangement with my counterparty. This arrangement tells me that if the aggregate value of these trades is positive, it would mean that I have a credit exposure to my counterparty and therefore my counterparty will be required to post collateral with me to support this credit exposure. Okay. Alternatively, if the aggregate value of this portfolio turns out to be negative, it's my counterparty which has a credit exposure to me and I'll be required to post collateral with my counterparty. Okay. Now, in order to balance the risk mitigation benefit that collateral provides with the increased operational burden of posting and receiving collateral, collateral arrangements they have within them this concept of a threshold. So there will be a threshold that applies to the counterparty. There will be a threshold that applies to me. How does this threshold work? Well, if I were to focus on this portion of the timeline, the aggregate value of these trades is positive. Yes, but the aggregate value is still below the threshold that we have in place for the counterparty okay so the counterparty needn't post collateral if the exposure is still below the threshold it can wait for the exposure to climb above the threshold and then only post collateral to the extent of the exposure being above the threshold okay so at this point in time you can request for collateral that is this much so this portion, it still stays uncollateralized. If my counterparty were to fail, I will not be able to extract the benefit from these trades that I was winning on in full. Okay, this portion was uncollateralized and hence I'll only be able to recover some portion of this uncollateralized exposure and incur a loss on the remaining portion. Okay, this tells me that there is this cost associated with the default of my counterparty. Okay, let's call it a cost of counterparty risk and let's place this cost in heading number one. Okay, now this portion of my exposure is uncollateralized, we already know this. I can think of this portion to be an asset okay and like any other asset on my balance sheet this portion needs to be financed 
okay when i talk about financing this asset then i should talk about the funding cost involved when i go to the market and try and raise funding then the interest let's say which i'll end up paying depends on the market perceived risk which i carry on my balance sheet risk which can come from credit risk it can come from counterparty risk credit risk etc okay so higher is the risk higher should be the funding cost involved okay so this portion not only contributes to cost of counterparty risk but it also contributes to funding cost and let's place this cost in a separate heading which is related to funding now let's talk about this portion the collateralized portion now although this portion is collateralized it involves some kind of optionality what is this optionality well what i have done is that in my collateral agreement i have specified a range of you know eligible collateral i leave it to my counterparty to decide which collateral it picks to post with me and typically my counterparty will run some kind of optimization at its end and post collateral which is let's say cheapest to deliver okay so there is this cost associated with extending this optionality to my counterparty and let's place this cost in heading number 3 a heading which we will associate with collateral okay now when i enter this portion of the timeline the tide has turned the aggregate value of these positions is now negative and it's my counterparty which now has an exposure to me okay again there is a threshold arrangement in place a threshold which applies to me although the value of the trades is negative i can wait for the aggregate value to become more negative compared to this horizontal line that we have drawn and only then be required to post collateral with my counterparty okay so even when i post collateral it will only be this much this portion will still stay uncollateralized okay now if let's say i were to focus on this portion the uncollateralized portion if i myself were to default then although i owe a certain amount to my counterparty my counterparty will only be able to extract a fraction of this amount okay and therefore because i am not paying my counterparty in full i stand to gain because of my own default okay so this is like a benefit it's a benefit associated with my own default risk let's place this benefit again in heading number 1 the same heading in which we placed this cost associated with counterparty risk now coming back to this portion and focusing on this fact that it is uncollateralized tells me that i am saving funding cost for this portion right i do not have to you know go to the market and borrow money to post collateral corresponding to this portion and therefore this gives me a funding benefit okay and because it is funding related let's again put it in heading number 2 but do remember this was a funding cost this is a funding benefit now if i were to focus on this portion because i am the one who is posting collateral i hold the optionality to decide which one is the cheapest to deliver cheapest to post collateral okay so the cost slash benefit associated with that optionality can be placed again in heading number 3 okay now in headings 1 2 and 3 we have included costs and benefits which are number 1 symmetrical if it was a cost here it becomes a benefit here and vice versa and number 2 these kind of depended on or let's say were linked with the sign of the aggregate market value of these transactions or the aggregate value of these transactions now please note that there are also costs which are not symmetrical and which do not really depend on the sign of 
the aggregate value of all these trades put together. The first of these costs, let's place them in heading number four, are related to regulatory capital. This is a portfolio of derivatives trades, right? And this portfolio does have risks in it. And the regulator would want you to set aside capital for these risks. This capital will be high quality capital, okay? Most probably it will be equity capital. And therefore, you have to factor in the expected rate of return which your shareholders want for this equity capital. This expected rate of return has to be factored in in the valuation of these derivatives positions. Okay, so this heading number four is cost of regulatory capital. Then heading number five is the cost associated with initial margin requirement. So initial margin typically is required in exchanges. It's required in central counterparties. But after the financial crisis, new regulation also requires initial margin to be posted for bilateral clearing as well. So bilateral margin requirements, they also include initial margin now. What is initial margin? Think of it to be an extra layer of buffer. Think of it to be an extra, or let's say, over collateralization that is required to, let's say, help you out if you have to unwind replace or rehedge trades that were done with let's say a defaulted counterparty okay so during that period of time when you are rehedging or re replacing these trades this extra buffer this over collateralization comes and helps you the cost associated with this initial margin would go in this heading number five okay now where do we start we have identified a few costs a few benefits and we have placed them in five different categories. Now let's do this. Let's try and see how these costs and benefits can be factored into the valuation of this portfolio of derivatives. Let's do this. As a starting point, let's arrive at something called a base valuation. A, val a valuation which does not take into account all these costs and benefits that we have identified. It does not take into account anything to do with counterparty credit risk. Okay, so I can think of base valuation to be a no default valuation or maybe a risk free valuation. Okay, it's a very simple valuation which ignores all these costs and benefits. Now let's do this. Let's individually take all these costs and benefits that we have identified and let's calculate the expected value of each of these costs and benefits standing as of today. That means let's calculate a present value of the expected cost or the expected benefit of each of these. Okay. So if let's say I were to start with heading number one and focus on cost of counterparty risk, the present value of the expected loss that I will incur if my counterparty were to fail can be called the CVA, the credit valuation adjustment. Okay, then again in heading number one, if let's say I were to calculate the present value of the expected benefit that I'll get from my own default, let's call that present value to be DVA debt valuation adjustment okay then in this heading this category let's say i were to calculate the present value of all future expected funding costs let's call it fca funding cost adjustment then the present value of all future expected funding related benefits let, let's call it funding benefit adjustment Let's combine the two and let's call it FVA, Funding Valuation Adjustment. Okay, then coming to heading number three. Heading number three was related to collateral. So in this, I would include the cost slash benefit associated with optionality and also associated with a non-standard set of collateral terms, for example, unequal thresholds. Okay, so this, the present value of all set of future expected costs and benefits associated with collateral would go into collateral valuation adjustment. 
the present value of future or expected cost of regulatory capital would go into KVA capital valuation adjustment this was my heading number four and then finally this guy number five would give me the MVA the margin valuation adjustment which is the present value of the future expected cost of posting initial margin okay now once I have all these adjustments I can apply all these adjustments one after the other to my base valuation and arrive at the actual valuation of my derivatives portfolio which has taken into account different aspects related to counterparty credit risk okay now before I stop two things to keep in mind first of all there might be factors involved which feed into more than one valuation adjustment for example collateral collateral feeds into collateral valuation adjustment and because collateral has a funding implication to it it also feeds into FVA okay so collateral feeds into both FVA and call VA the second thing for you to remember is that although we have drawn these valuation adjustments as very non overlapping layers sitting on top of each other in practice these layers might have an overlap involved for example there might be an overlap involved when it comes to DVA a benefit associated with your own default and FBA a benefit associated with funding okay so this video was about understanding different XVAs now we understand hopefully so the reason or the source of each of these valuation adjustments and also our aim was to understand how these adjustments can be applied to something called a base valuation to arrive at an actual valuation okay